Should you swim with your fingers together or apart or somewhere in between? Have you ever experimented with this? What have you found and how do you know what's best for you? The answer to this is one of the most interesting facts of the last couple of decades of biomechanical and CFD, that's computational fluid dynamics research. And yet, in today's video, I'm going to place a fun and pragmatic spin on this involving an old English tradition, oh, I say. a wet fish, and a simple visualization that you can join in with to help improve your swimming. All of which I guarantee you won't have heard anywhere else before. My name is Paul Newsom, and here at Swim Smooth, we blend both the science and art of freestyle swimming in a way that is only possible with decades of iterative at the coal face, swim coaching with real swimmers like you who haven't necessarily grown up following the black line for hours every day. And even if you have, you might just learn a thing or two about your own stroke technique in today's video. So let's get to it. Back in 2013, I wrote a blog post on this exact topic called, probably not surprisingly, Fingers Together or Apart. In a response to an article published just 12 months earlier in the Journal of Theoretical Biology titled The Constructal Law of Physics of Why Swimmers Must Spread Their Fingers and Toes, highlights from that scientific journal really caught the attention of the general public. This is probably no wonder given the findings showed, one, the total force capable of being applied to the water is 53% greater when the fingers are spaced optimally. You'll know this to be the case if you've ever swum with paddles on, as it feels harder to pull through with the larger surface area created by the paddle. Two, the speed advantage of spacing the fingers optimally could be as much as 2.5%. The study showed that the optimal spacing is twice the boundary layer thickness of one finger, which would equate to between 3 millimeters and 8 millimeters, or just a few sheets of paper, really. The boundary layer is the water immediately adjacent to any body part which is moving as a result of the body moving through the water. By spacing the fingertips apart so that the edge of the boundary layer of one finger exactly meets the edge of the boundary layer of another finger, you can increase the drag coefficient, which serves to increase the surface area of your catch and pull through. The theoretical predictions of the article were reportedly confirmed by computational fluid dynamics simulations, so they must be right, right? In the years since, many YouTube swimming coaches and influencers have jumped on this very bandwagon, simply showing the findings from the article and giving the advice as gospel that this is how we should all swim. But is it really? Let's look at this great image of Michael Phelps side by side with Ian Thorpe. In one of the greatest showdowns of all time in the pool, Ian Thorpe managed to triumph over both Peter Van den Hoogerman and Michael Phelps in the final of the men's 200 meter freestyle at the 2004 Athens Olympics. It still gives me goosebumps thinking about that one. But back to the still image of Phelps and Thorpe, two of the world's best swimmers. Clearly, they're both entering into the water with fingertips splayed apart, right? Right. But what about their other hand, the one actually catching and pulling through, open or closed? Quite clearly closed. Now let's look at Rebecca Adlington's stroke. Of course, you all know I love Becky's technique, but one of my favorite aspects is her hand entry and initial catch. Look at how poised her hand is as it enters into the water, fingertips together, spearing the water like she's about to spear a fish swimming ahead of her. There's so much intent to this action. It's not happening by chance. And despite how relaxed the rest of her stroke looks, at that very moment of hand entry, her hand has intent, tone, and very much purpose to it. By the way, if you're enjoying this video, please like, subscribe, and hit that little notification bell down below. It really helps us. As often happens, someone sent me this publicly available video clip for comment on at the same time as the scientific journal was released, as they were concerned that the instruction to swim with a relaxed hand and spread fingers had been over-exaggerated by the swimmer. I'd agree, and yet the commentator's voiceover states that they really love the swimmer's relaxed hand position with the fingers spread as they are. In order to swim as efficiently as you can, you need to both reduce drag and increase the effective propulsion. This swimmer might feel like they have very little drag because of all the work they've diligently done on their balance in the water. But one could argue that the reason they're still swimming very slow is because their stroke rate is just 26 strokes per minute with no engagement or catch on the water at all due in part to the lack of tone in their hand. 
Certainly, this scientific review gained the interest and inspiration of many swimmers attending our courses since its release. And I doubt that I have not once delivered a swimmer's clinic or coach's course without being asked about my take upon it. Let's look at this clip from one of our three-day coach education courses in Mallorca, Spain. The next of which, coincidentally, is coming up on the 25th of May, 2024. Click the link somewhere around the screen to find out more and to sign up. During the course, one of the coaches posed this same question about whether to swim with your fingers together or apart. I had all of the coaches hop into the water to test it out using our skull number one drill to experiment pragmatically. The audio is a little hard to hear, but watch how all the coaches slow down significantly when they firstly spread their fingers, then lose all the tone in their hands, and finally apply the brakes as many overgliders unwittingly do so. Right. Okay, let's even go two abreast. We can go two abreast on this here. So I thought you'd be keen to go there. Okay, two abreast. Let's get going. Sculling, as we should be doing. So we should feel like we're just caressing the water. Okay, now what I want you to do is open your fingers very wide. Okay. Oh. Oh. Slow down a little bit. Yeah. Now I want you to let your hand go very limp. Mm -hmm. So there's no toe to the hand. Okay. Now go back to what you were doing. Focus quickly. So give yourself some tone to the hand. Notice how you start to move forwards. Now let's do the other one. The drop rail goes to the middle of the surface. Let's try it like this. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. All right. So the only secret to teaching the sculling drill is to remember, fingertips below wrist, wrist below elbow, in this position like we're reaching over a barrel, and the swimmer wants to have good tone to their hands. So closing your fingertips up a little bit more there, Susan, that's it. Excellent. Very nice. Very nice. Okay, all the way on to the end. Let's see how we're going here then. All right. That's great there, Darren, really good. Silly little thing for those of you just finishing off and just watching how you're doing it from behind here. Minor, minor point. Make sure your toes are pointed and turned in. Don't allow your feet to be turned out like Charlie Chaplin. That's going to put the brakes on it in itself. So have your toes turned in. Rob, make sure those big toes are actually turned in, touching each other. There you go. Notice no, how your legs are slightly playing up. Lifting the legs just a little bit higher. That's good, great. Very nice. If you can then go from skull number one into freestyle, you can also immediately experiment with how well you transfer that feeling of the water into the propulsive phase of your stroke. So whilst the Scientific Journal article came out in 2012, way back in 2010, we released our hit DVD, the Swim Smooth Catch Masterclass. And would you believe it? We featured a fun little exercise you can try along with at home to test your dexterity in the context of other major issues in your stroke that are more likely to be holding you back in your swimming and how far apart your fingers are. Let's try this little practical demonstration. Hold your hands up like so, fingertips closed. Open them as wide as they'll go. Close them up, open, close, open, close, open, close, open. Now let's try and close the fingertips so you've got the width of around about two or three sheets of paper between each fingertip. Do you notice that your fingers are actually shaking or vibrating there, just to try and hold that position. The reason being is this is a very, very fine motor skill to be able to hold your fingertips just ever so slightly apart. You will see many elite swimmers swimming exactly like that, with the fingertips just ever so slightly apart. What happens here is as the swimmer actually pulls through, turbulence is actually created between the fingertips, which creates like an eddying effect and allows them to catch and pull through the water without water actually slipping through the fingertips but it's very, very easy to actually allow your fingertips to slip a little bit too wide, as most of you are probably doing. Doing this, you'll actually slip through the water completely and be missing out on some of that catch and pull through underneath the water. My recommendation here is to have your fingertips closed, but just not clenched. That's a very fine motor skill, like I said before, and most of us have gross motor skills, such as crossing over, whether or not we're bending our elbows properly underneath the water, which are holding us back at a greater extent than whether or not your fingertips are slightly open or closed. So finally then, what does an old English tradition, a wet fish, and a simple visualization have to do with all of this? Well, 
When I'm teaching the right amount of tone that the hand needs to have to swim with effective propulsion whilst avoiding too much rigidity, I'll take the English tradition of a firm gentleman's handshake as an example. This is especially effective when working with younger swimmers who often lack tone in their hands, especially when they go through rapid growth spurts, which can affect some of their musculoskeletal coordination. So what better example than to ask my six foot three inch, 14 year old son for his help in demonstrating this. So I'm here with Jackson now. Jackson, I'm going to ask you to try and shake my hand with a firm gentleman's handshake. Good work. Okay. Now, what I want you to do now is give me an absolute bone crusher. Try and crush my hand. Now, he's a very strong kid, and he's able to really put a lot of pressure on there. But if you try to swim with that amount of tone to your hand, it's going to really make you very, very tense and rigid. Now, though, this is how many of you might be swimming if you've been told to swim with your fingers apart or your hands really relaxed. Give me a wet fish handshake. Doesn't feel very nice, does it? No, not really. <laughs> so what we need is we need somewhere in between those two points. And this firm gentleman's handshake that we started off with, Jackson's got good tone to his hand. And if we try to visualize what that would look like in the water, that hand would be spearing in like Rebecca Adlington and making sure that you've got a good visual to actually pull through and press that water back behind you. I hope you found this video really useful and interesting. And if you did, please don't forget to like, subscribe, and hit that little bell down below to keep abreast of all our latest swim smooth videos thanks for watching catch you next time you can now get access to hundreds of swim smooth videos via the swim smooth guru from as little as two pounds per month visit swimsmooth.guru